Oh, welcome on board to everybody. Welcome to the SKF Stronger uh, program. And uh, this is one of the modules uh, defined by this program aimed to uh, provide external webinars for the customers. Um, good. Today we are talking about MVH, so noise and vibration. And uh, I'm going to switch off the camera that we switch on at the end of the presentation in order to have a better bandwidth. Um, great. Let's see if everything works. OK, fine. So my name is Angelico Prosio. I'm from Italy. I work in SKF and uh, I focus on noise and vibration together with uh, Pete Van Dalen that you see in the picture. And uh, uh, together, together we, we take care about noise and vibration competence center, let's say worldwide in a worldwide environment, different application, different asset. The agenda of today uh, is, uh, yeah, I try to develop something uh, interesting for the attendees. So we will not handle the, the, the standard topics. So I will not talk about bearing defects and uh, the standard condition monitoring technique. Um, I prefer to, 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 to give you a view about uh, the flavor, about uh, uh, some different topics. So we're going we're gonna to talk about bearing waveness. Uh, we are going to talk uh, about the squealing noise that affect a lot of uh, applications, above all the electric motors. And uh, the third topic that we will handle, it's about beating. <coughs> Beating is a very known topic and a noise and vibration, but uh, there are some some nice cases which can be of interest uh, where uh, beating can uh, occur because of uh, of uh, some sources overlapping one each other. And all of these three uh, topics will be supported by real cases. So the first part will be theory and definition and the second part it's uh, it's a real case that we experience and that we we fixed so good let's start from uh, the bearing waveness so and uh, let's let's start on uh, on defining how how we produce bearing so basically the the bearing production is uh, made by several steps and uh, at the end of this step there are two crucial steps uh, which are very important from a waveness perspective, uh, which are uh, the grinding and the honing. The grinding uh, has the aim to uh, better finish the surface for sure, to get the right dimension of the raceways and uh, of the different components. Uh, the components in the bearing, you know, are uh, inner ring, outer ring, rolling element and cage. Uh, and there is a third uh, aim that is uh, to reduce the long wavelength form deviation. In this picture, you can recognize what are the long wavelength form deviation and basically are described by the black area. OK, there is a black area right over here and a black area right over there. OK, so after having grinded, this black area shall be reduced. Unfortunately, the grinding cannot reduce the shorter wavelength form deviation. And the shorter wavelength form deviation, you probably already figure out, are represented by the vertical lines that you see in these pictures. OK, fine, because in the end, we're going to perform the honing after the grinding. And uh, the honing has uh, the objective uh, to get the a proper tribology, so a smooth and surface, the proper tribology from a metallurgic perspective of the raceway in order to get the sufficient uh, uh, lubricant inside uh, inside the particles, let's say, and to properly lubricate the, 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 the components. Uh, a second aim of the honing is surely to remove this shorter uh, wavelength of a foreign deviation. Still, we will never get a perfect bearing, so we can get still some longer wave wavelength after having on the bearing. OK, and as you see, for instance, in this picture, we still have some long wavelength. There is a black area right over here and another one right over there. OK, so after having 
said that, we can say that form deviation, that means waveness, are intrinsic to the manufacturing process. But how do we define the waveness? Waveness is, uh, is uh, uh, a deviation, a form deviation. Uh, and that's fine, but either roughness can could could be interpreted as a, a as waveness, and instead we shall not. So in bearings and as in many other application, we have the earth and contact pressure that you can see in the scheme at the center of the slide, and the earth and contact pressure has uh, can be described by a length, if you like. Okay, in one dimension, uh, we can we can describe this length as a two B. And uh, OK, the depth uh, instead is A, where we get the maximum uh, pressure. But let's focus on 2B. So the, 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 the length of the, of, of the contact area is, is described by 2B. So we can define waveness, anything that can not influence, not affect the Earth's and contact pressure. So let's say that the rule of thumb is that this, uh, that the, the wavelength shall be larger than two times this length. So if uh, this is defined by 2B, everything that is larger than 4B can be defined as waveness. And on the left side, you get an example. This is waveness because actually it doesn't affect the contact pressure, Hertz and contact pressure, and instead the bottom picture, affect, it's affected by the contact pressure. So it's uh, this, this cannot be considered waveness. OK, fine. Now, let's try to figure out if waveness can generate high forces. So let's suppose to, uh, to get a real bearing, and that is not an ideal one. OK, this is very bad, bad bearing, but anyhow, we have a residual waveness on the inner ring, there are residual waveness on the rolling element, and there is either residual waveness on the outer ring. Let's focus on on the rolling element. The rolling element is pressed between the inner ring and the outer ring. And so because of the form deviation, it's subjected by a change, a variation of contact forces. And this change and variation of contact forces is described by the following formula that is uh, very common. OK, and, and it's the product of the stiffness, the contact stiffness uh, times uh, the amplitude of the form deviation that is described by this uh, Greek letter. OK, since the contact stiffness in the bearing uh, is pretty high because it is in the order of 10 power 7 up to 10 power 9 Newton or over meter, uh, either a very small form deviation, and now we can get to a range between one nanometer up to one micrometer. So either a small form deviation can generate pretty high force that cannot be neglected. OK, this is an example and we are going to get 1000 Newton that definitely cannot be neglected. So it's important to, to figure out that waveness can generate very high force. The bottom part of the slide is just to remind that now we're focusing on waveness of the inner ring, outer ring, rolling element, whatever. But it's exactly the same if we, if instead of having an inner ring for deviation, we are having a, a shaft waveness. Uh, basically, we will get the same result of having a, the inner ring for deviation. Okay. That's fine. Now, after having described that uh, waveness can generate uh, pretty high forces, we need to figure out how to detect them. So let's start from a very simple case. So. Uh, on the top left, you can see that we are having an inner ring rotating, outer ring is, 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 is stop, and uh, the inner ring has a form deviation n equal to 1. So it's basically not rounded, but it's like uh, eccentric. And uh, this is defined by the blue curve, okay? You see that it's, it's like an eccentric inner ring, okay? So now we get the red arrows. The red arrows uh, describe the the force between the rolling element and the outer rings. And then we have uh, the red curve and the red curve is the force field generated by the red arrows. That's fine. What can we say if we position uh, a sensor over a bearing or over the housing? Let's say that we will get 
the force generated by the red curve, okay? And uh, what is its frequency? Its frequency, it's exactly the frequency of the shaft, because as you see, the blue curve is synchronous with the red curve. So if the shaft is rotating at 1800 RPM, divided by 60, we get 30 Hertz, that you can see right over here. So basically the, the shaft is rotating at 30 Hertz, and we will get the vibration at 30 Hertz because we get an eccentric form deviation equal to one. Likewise, we can describe a waveness with uh, the waveness number equal to two. So basically we get an oval shape of the inner ring. Then we, we will get the different uh, forces over the rolling element and, uh, and the outer ring. They will describe a red curve that uh, that is the force field, and uh, let's say this time we will get a maximum amplitude two times for each rotation. You can see that each for each rotation we will get two maximum amplitude. So two times each rotation means double the rotational speed. So if we if in the earlier example we had 30 years, this time we will have 60 years. So this kind of of waveness generate two times the rotational speed or two times the frequency. So in our case, 60 Hertz. And likewise, we can do exactly the same, uh, the same thinking about uh, a triangular shape. So three shapes, different uh, forces between rolling element and the outer ring and triangular shape that is basically synchronous to the inner ring. Fine. Something that we need to notice, it's about the amplitude. So the first one is, uh, the first peak is uh, has a higher amplitude than the second one, that has a higher amplitude than the third one. And this makes sense because it's physics. Let's say more complex is uh, the shape that we want to generate, uh, lower is the amplitude because of the stiffness, let's say. <clears throat> Fine, so, so far, Pretty easy, but now let's try to complicate a little bit the matter. And let's suppose to have the same bearing with eight rolling elements. So the, the, the geometry, anyhow, it's important. And uh, eight rolling element that you can see in the animation, and we have uh, a wave number equal to five. So that's fine. We have five lobes over the inner ring described by the blue curve. That's fine. We will get some forces between the rolling element and the outer ring, which are described by the red arrows. That's fine. And this combination of red arrows can describe the force field that is the red curve. That's fine. Nothing has changed uh, to, to the previous example. But, but the same arrows which describe the forces between the rolling element and the outer ring can describe a different curve. They Exactly the same arrows can describe this force field that is counterclockwise and has a different frequency, has a different speed. So what's going on? Uh, this is what is called spatial aliasing. And uh, so basically when we get five lobes on the inner ring, we will get both combination of the force field. We will have a, a force field that is that has five uh, as a K factor and another force field that has a three as a K factor. And the K factor is the four deviation of the force field. And uh, what do we expect in the spectral domain? We will expect to have the contribution from this four field that will be five times the rotation speed that is right over here, 150 Hertz. That's fine. It's lower than the fourth, the third, and the second one, and the first one. That's fine. The amplitude is a little bit lower. But the triangular shape instead of the force field instead generate a node frequency that is not an integer multiple of the rotational speed. Uh, can we uh, describe what is this, this frequency? Yes, there is a, there is a complex uh, formula that you can find in the web, or otherwise you can drop me an email and I can and I can and I can forward you. It's not today's topic, it's important to, to understand the, the phenomena right now. So fine, we will get both. We will get five times the rotational speed and we will get this frequency that is not an integer multiple of the rotational speed that has a higher amplitude. Okay, so 
uh, what's the reason why we have called it uh, special aliasing? Uh, for whom of you are confident with uh, signal processing, they can easily figure out uh, the analogy with the signal processing when you describe the maximum frequency detectable uh, picking a certain uh, sampling frequency. And this is an animation just to remind what it is. Actually, we, we get a ghost, a ghost frequency. OK, good. Let's see. OK, now we will, uh, we will, uh, yeah, we will show a real case. So uh, a customer asked our support because they suspected a bearing problem and uh, they had, uh, uh, it's, it's a motor manufacturer customer and uh, they had the three motors. Uh, uh, they were testing this, these three motors and one over one motor over these three was noisy. OK, so the motor uh, has a variable speed range between 0 and 3000 RPM because it was supposed to be driven by the variable frequency drive. The customer, since it was a, uh, an OEM, uh, it didn't uh, apply any kind of load, so it's, uh, it's operating uh, under idle condition and it's an induction asynchronous two poles motor. Bearing arrangement, pretty standard, two ball bearing, drive end on the uh, located bearing on the drive end side, uh, non-located bearing on the non-drive end side. As you can see here, there is, a, mm, there is a spring. Great, then we decided to perform some tests and we decided to perform uh, the run up from zero to the maximum speed, that is 3000 RPM. Then we wanted to record the measurement uh, at the maximum speed in steady state condition at 3000 RPM. Then uh, we wanted to plan to take either measurement uh, under the noisy speed, if we can figure out what is the noisy speed. And then uh, what I would like to remark, it's about the shutdown. We call shutdown what, what is different from the coast down because actually with motors, uh, uh, electrical power, let's say, uh, it's, uh, it's always nice to perform um, a test cutting off the power. So basically really preventing everything that comes from electrical sources uh, from, uh, from the mechanical sources. So cutting off the power, we, we, we really get the, the mechanical behavior without any kind of influence of the electrical sources unless a little bit of inertia. OK, and uh, the final test that we wanted to, to, to plan, it was uh, aimed to the preload. Uh, I said that basically it's tested in under idle condition. Yeah, that's true, but we can easily play with the springs on the non-located bearing. So we can add some springs or we can remove some springs and basically we shall be able to, uh, to change the natural frequency from one side and to change the stiffness on the other side. So let's say this can be a pretty smart test anyhow. Um, good, then we position three accelerometers uh, in order to take the vibration. Great, in the different uh, axis and we position either a microphone. Uh, why do we use both? Uh, we use both because uh, if the customer complains about noise, we want to, reprodu to reproduce what the customer listen by their ears. And so the microphone measurement, it's nice in order to uh, drive us uh, on what is the focus. Do we need to focus uh, below one kilohertz, between one kilohertz and three kilohertz, or uh, over six kilohertz or whatever, okay? And since the transfer path uh, is completely different uh, uh, from, from, the, from, from the sensors, from the accelerometers, uh, it's nice to combine both sensing. This is uh, our suggestion. Good, so let's see what's going on. So let's listen to the sound. Uh, during this test, we run up the motor from zero up to 3000. In order to, because of time, let's say I slice the signal and so you will hear some a part of the signal, otherwise it takes too long. And uh, now I'm going to be mute. Please pay attention. At a certain moment, you shall be able to uh, hear a really yelling and tonal noise. Okay, really tonal yelling, louding like hell. Let's play. Okay, 
Very good. I hope it was audible. Uh, in the time signal, you can notice that when it's yelling, we really have an increase of the row signal, okay, and then it's going to decrease afterward. Keep in mind that, that we are always speeding up the motor. So there is a, a critical speed where we really can hear this tonal and yelling noise. And this is a spectrogram. Uh, in the x-axis, we have the time domain. In the y-axis, we have the frequency domain. And the third dimension, so the amplitude, is given by the, 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 the color, OK? So as you can see, over the time, we are increasing the speed. And there are many harmonics of the rotational speed which are increasing, which are these sloping lines. That's fine. And there is a specific frequency that is uh, around one kilohertz that is excited somewhere. OK, and then you can hear that. Then you can see that there are some red spots over one kilohertz. Good. So uh, is it bearing related or is it? Is it not bearing related? Uh, let's exchange the bearing. Let's figure out if uh, the same bearing set is going to be noisy again in another motor. And actually it is, so it's the bearing. And uh, so this is exactly the same sound file that we you have here uh, before. Let's play it again. Exactly the same. And here, stop this one. Here instead, you can see the spectrogram of uh, the first motor after having, having changed the, bear, the bearing. And so basically, you, you don't see any kind of red spot and uh, it's noise free. Let's listen to the, to the sound. Yeah, completely different, so pretty silent. Good, so the, the, the following question is, is it the bearing such bad or uh, it's something different? And uh, what I found interesting, and I hope you find as well, is that uh, in the end, uh, the bearing quality was fine, okay? Uh, we always get some residual waveness in our bearings, always. Uh, all the premium brand got it anyhow. Uh, let's say this bearing in that specific application can be noisy. If you mount it in, in another application, can can be completely silent. Let's explain the reason why. So what we need to perform is the noise and vibration analysis. So first of all, we want to figure out if there are mechanical uh, issues and actually there weren't, so no unbalancing or relevant unbalancing, no misalignment, no mechanical looseness, whatever. What about bearing effect? No bearing effect, no scratch. When I'm talking about defect, I'm talking about scratches, dents, uh, spores, okay, something like that. And actually, there are not because we performed the enveloping and we didn't see anything. So the, 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 the envelope was pretty clean. OK, no electrical sources. Oh, OK, the, the variable frequency drive always introduce many sources, but in this case, OK, it's, it's not at this frequency at least. It's at a higher frequency. OK, great. And and then then we perform the wavelength analysis. And uh, we said, OK, let's let's see if uh, if there is a residual wavelength somewhere in our bearing that that can excite something at a certain speed. And from this analysis, that is basically related to what I showed you in the, in the previous chapter, uh, we discover that uh, uh, there was an inner ring wavelength related to wavelength number 48. OK. That was exciting the frequency 960. OK, OK, that's fine. This is a, the exciting force. But the following question is, uh, is this exciting force uh, uh, overlapping a resonance? And in order to figure out that, uh, we we perform the calculation, the dynamic calculation, actually either from the spectrum, we already noticed that was a fixed, a fixed frequency, not changing, uh, varying the speed. So 
we already suspected that it was a, a resonance. But after having calculated the resonance of the system, and the system has been simplified with a rotor, with the cover and the bearings, you can notice that these are the, the eigen modes, and uh, the axle mode of the cover is 950. That is pretty close to what we have uh, here related to as a, an exciting force coming from the waveness. So the waveness, unfortunately, at a certain speed, excite the natural frequency of the cover, and the cover really act like a, like a subwoofer or like a loudspeaker, if you if you like. And so you can clearly hear an annoying noise as you, as we did before. Okay, so is it bearing bad? No, it's it's bearing. Yeah, let's say unfortunately this bearing is not suitable for for this for this application because there, are, there is a natural frequency that can, re, can be really excited by this residual waveness, okay? But if you go back and you check in your end of line quality test this bearing, it's pretty fine. Okay, so what we did in order to confirm what we have discovered or what we have calculated and measured, uh, we dismounted the bearing and uh, we measured the profile of the inner ring and actually we noticed that there were two dominant wavelengths, wavelengths number four and wavelengths number 48. Actually 48 is a multiple of four as well and anyhow the 48 unfortunately at a certain speed excited the axial mode of the cover of the of the of the motor as we know. So this is a confirmation. Uh, that's that's the conclusion. There is an additional comment for uh, for geeks, okay, for for uh, the most confident people. Uh, this is uh, unfortunately an, an unlucky case because in this case we we did have eight rolling element, and 48 is either a multiple of eight. So let's say that we have an overlapping of forces in our in our system. Okay, this is a slight remark. A secondary remark, but anyhow, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's not really lucky. OK, so let's go through the conclusion. Bearing waveness can generate high forces. No doubt we have calculated that. Natural frequency can be excited by waveness at specific speeds and tonal noise. So this is important to keep in mind. So basically the, 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 the end of line tests uh, are related to the component. Once you mount your bearing, in a different system, they interact, different components interact with each other. So the application perspective, it's important to, to take care. That's the reason why in-spec bearings might not match application needs. And uh, noise and vibration analysis can detect bearing waveness, we described uh, in the previous chapter. Uh, application approach is, approach is needed to analyze the dynamic of the system. Yeah, and uh, when the noise is the focus we suggested to take both vibration and sound. <clears throat> and when I'm talking about sound, I'm not talking about DBA, okay? I'm talking about uh, having uh, the raw signal coming from the microphone, okay? The, the sound pressure is not valuable because of environment, unless you are not in an anechoic room. Okay, let's go to the, to the next topic. Um, squealing noise. Squealing noise is uh, it's a really annoying uh, noise. Uh, let's listen first. Okay, so how do you describe this kind of noise? It's uh, it's it's really okay. It's definitely annoying, worrying. That's fine. Uh, it looks like be metallic. Let's say it looks like be something like rattling. Okay, rattling. Or many many people try to figure out uh, what is the source, and they think that this kind of noise is generated by the cage. Actually, it doesn't. It's not the cage of the bearing. OK, actually, it's it's something about uh, rolling element and rings. OK, but it's not about the cage. Uh, does it affect SKF bearings? Yes. Does it affect uh, other brand bearings? Yes, 
actually it's a physical phenomena. OK, is it uh, is it quality related? No, it's it's physical. So basically there are no scratch over the raceway. If you dismount the bearing, the, the bearing can be completely perfect. OK, uh, the, 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 the standard scenario is that uh, it happens uh, when uh, bearings are grease lub lubricated. OK, usually when they are not 360 loaded, when they have a small loaded area like in the electric motor, basically they, they have uh, usually the bearing have a, a limited loaded area. So this means that it, it happens more often for horizontal uh, horizontal axis rather than axis, uh, vertical axis. Uh, more often, uh, more often at low temperature. And uh, uh, experience in a medium and large bearing. Uh, we didn't experience in a, in small bearing, so below 50. Yeah, let's say let, let, let me figure out below 20 millimeters of bore. Just to, to give you an idea. OK, uh, some examples. Uh, large electric motor with cylindrical roller bearing, so large electric motor can be definitely affected. This is one of the application. Medium size electric motor with cylindrical roller bearing or deep groove ball bearing. OK. And another experience application, it's about uh, elevators hoist and elevators, but above all elevators and lifts. Where uh, there are uh, ball bearing, but there are often either a spherical roller bearing. All of them are grease lubricated usually. And let's listen to the noise. <laughs> let's listen to the second one. Looks like a whistle. Huh? And let's listen to the third one. The third one is uh, is lower, OK? But uh, you can figure out that if you are uh, lifting up in an elevator, you, you don't want to hear any kind of noise, let's say, either if it is not reliability uh, related. Great. OK. So our R&D development model and uh, uh, simulate the, the simulation uh, performs some tests and validated the model. So basically uh, the, the vibration signature of the squealing noise is uh, uh, characterized by wide band peaks. For instance, in this model, the wideband peaks it's around five kilohertz, so it's what you see right over here. And usually, these wideband peaks generate some harmonics. So, if it is at five kilohertz, we are going to get the ten kilohertz, and either at fifteen kilohertz. Okay. Um, in addition to that, uh, we notice that these wideband peaks are characterized by a ripple that you can zoom in right over here. And uh, this is a real measurement, and you, as you see, uh, we have 5.5 uh, kilohertz or 6 ki kilohertz as a wideband peak, and it's harmonic here and uh, maybe right over there. Is it possible to identify this frequency? Uh, is it always 5 kilohertz? Actually not. So let's say it's not possible because uh, depend it's strictly dependent from, from, from the application itself and from the transfer path. So we can't say it will be five kilohertz. We can say it's it's going to appear between three and 15 kilohertz, so pretty high frequency. But uh, unless we don't have all the drawing or whatever, we, we need to create another model and it's time consuming and effort consuming. Uh, let's say we, we can't say it's, 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 it's five kilohertz or under a certain speed, it's always at, at, at that frequency. OK. Um, Examples, so exactly the examples that I that I show you up uh, a little bit earlier. So this is the electric motor, uh, the cylindrical roller bearing, and we see this, the wide band peak right over here, and it's harmonic here. 
and then we have uh, a slightly different behavior for the deep group or bearing, but actually better, better noticeable uh, the ripple right over here. But anyway, we have uh, the, this wide band peak here and it's harmonic right over there. And uh, yeah, again, uh, slightly different for the spherical roller bearing, but basically uh, with different amplitude, we get the same, the same signature. OK. So let's have a look now at the case. So the customer complain about about noise. As usual, they suppose it was bearing related. Actually, it is bearing related. It's it's a physical phenomena anyhow, but any, any, anyhow, we, we, we need to figure out if it is a quality issue, if it is a reliability issue, or if it is uh, something uh, that allow us to, to operate the motor anyhow. So this is a, a medium motor and uh, 560 kilowatt uh, fixed speed at 3000 RPM, two, per, two poles, uh, sorry, uh, four poles, two pole pairs. And we got the ball bearing, uh, the same one on the drive hand side and on the non drive hand side, exactly similar to, to, to the previous example. The non drive hand side is the non located bearing and we got some springs over there. And the C4, it's about the clearance. So we have a higher clearance than, than the normal. But uh, keep in mind that the clearance, uh, it's just to compensate the delta temperature under the operating condition. This doesn't mean that the bearing uh, will operate at higher clearance. OK, it's, it's related to, to the heat generated by the motor itself. OK, so let's observe uh, the noise. And uh, we recorded the noise. And uh, I'm gonna uh, play the recording in a, in a, in a second. And uh, you will notice, uh, you can already notice in the time signal that we have uh, no noise and suddenly it jumps up and we got a lot of noise and without changing anything. So same speed, same load, idle condition actually. Uh, so no load. At a certain moment it disappeared for a while and then it appears again. Then disappear, then it appears again. And you can notice exactly the same if you look at the spectrogram. So time over frequency in amplitude that is given by, by the color. And you can already notice that uh, the squealing noise in this case is uh, the highest energy is basically concentrated on uh, between five and six kilohertz. OK, let's let's play. I would be very worried if I would listen to this noise. And um, but you shouldn't. <laughs> this is the reason why I'm I'm showing off uh, this uh, this part. So yeah, it's really on and off, on and off. Okay. And uh, if you have the chance to lubricate the bearing with some with some additional grease, most probably you will notice that the, the noise will disappear for a while. Okay. But after some minutes, it will get back again. OK, so uh, let's have a look at the uh, Fourier transform. You already know how to analyze it. So basically we should see a uh, wide band peak and here we are and it's harmonic. Here we got another one and maybe there is another one right over here. Do we get the ripple? Yes, probably yes. OK, and uh, what about the envelope? You know, the envelope is aimed to, to figure out all the repetitive phenomena. So everything that is really repetitive impulse, OK, like uh, electrical sources uh, like uh, scratch or defect over the raceway of the bearing. And what we can notice, this is really worrying, uh, it's that we can notice that there are some peaks related to the outer ring and actually this is exactly the frequency of the outer ring effect. So what's going on? There are some scratch over the outer ring raceway? Actually not. And if again, if you add some grease on your bearing, these, these peaks will disappear 
and end up this white band, white, white, white band peak. Okay. Um, after having fixed the squealing noise, in a few seconds I will explain you how we did fix. Uh, you can notice that in the FFT we don't have any more the wide band peaks, no more wide band peaks here, no more here, okay. And in the envelope we do not have any more the outer ring defect peaks, no more peaks that were present here, okay. And either the spectrum you don't have any more the red area, okay, between five and six kilohertz. That's fine. How did we fix it? So let's let's summarize the, the main topics. The squealing noise affects many breeze bearings, SKF and competitors. The squealing noise is not driven by quality issues, but experience in specific application and operating condition. I already mentioned you basically low limited loaded radial loaded area and uh, pretty high speed between 1500 and 3000 RPM. And uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Electric motors, elevators, whatever. After regreasing, the noise disappeared for a while. Okay. We have modeled the squealing noise so we can characterize the signature, the vibration signature. And uh, in this case, for instance, and usually we figure out what is the best proposal solution for the customer. In this case, for instance, we changed the preload of the bearing and we have identified an alternative grease suitable for the operating condition in order to prevent the squealing noise as well. Okay. Uh, a slight remark, uh, this case was related uh, in OEM, so a mo motor manufacturer. Uh, in the end, the motor is going to be supplied to, to, to the end user and uh, a load will be applied. Usually having uh, a load, it, uh, it uh, limits the squealing noise. So higher is the load, let's say, lower is the chance to have the, 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 the squealing noise. Okay, idle condition for sure are the, 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 the worst condition in order to get the squealing noise. That's the reason why we provide some support to the OEM customer, either at the end user customer in that case. Okay, so few minutes for the last case and uh, let's talk about the beating noise. Uh, all of you are, guess, I guess, confident what is what the beating is. Basically, we have two signals, slightly different. So sometimes they are in phase, sometimes they are out of phase. When they are in phase, their sum is a higher amplitude. When they are out of phase, their sum is uh, is reduced, or in this case, it's it's zero. Okay. So from a, from a, a sound perspective, you're going to receive it like a, a modulation or a variation in volume or in amplitude, if you like. Let's listen an example. Okay, so you have heard this kind of modulation that is probably, I would say, every one second, so one hertz. And uh, the, this motor is driving a pump and uh, it's, it's running at 18, 1800 RPM, that means 30 hertz. So it's definitely not coming from the rotation speed of the motor. What's going on? The bearing frequency are much higher than than the rotation speed, so it's not related to the bearings. In this case, actually, it was related to a rotor bar issue. I'm not going to explain what's the reason why. Uh, we shall uh, describe the uh, rotating magnetic uh, field and uh, and uh, the synchronous speed and the uh, and the rotor speed, and so the slip frequency, whatever. And this is not the topic today. What I would like to highlight is that it's uh, another case, a real case, in order to uh, to highlight how much important can be the, the beating. And this is a case related uh, to machine tools where we get two spindles, the SPM1 and SPN2, SP2. And the aim was to machine this disc on both sides. That's fine. The customer complained about about not about noise this time, but they complain about the quality, the finishing quality of the end product. 
you can already notice that there is a sort of shattering. There are many, many circular lines right over here, and they, they don't want it to get it. And uh, yeah, this is more visible. And so the customer shared with us that uh, this problem doesn't happen when, uh, when just one of the two spindle is machining and the other one is not machining, is in idle condition, okay? And uh, in the following way, that's fine. Then there is no chattering. In other case where they do not have any issue, it's when uh, both spindle run at the same speed, okay? And uh, the speed in this case, it's 3000 RPM. When they both run at 3000 RPM, no chattering. But since sometimes they need to run the SP2 at 3000 RPM and the SP1 at 2500 RPM, in that case, they notice the chattering. That's the beating. Okay, this is what I just described. And so we took the vibration and we took the vibration on the spindle one, but uh, either if we were, we had our sensor on the spindle one, we can highly feel the vibration coming from the spindle two. So spindle one is everything red and the spindle two is everything blue. And uh, let's say that the zoom about the rotation speed peaks, these come from the spindle one and these come from the spindle two. Okay, now we're looking just at the amplitude. We are not looking at the phase, but sometimes uh, they can be in phase and sometimes they can be out of phase. And so this is the beating. What is the delta? It's the delta of this, the two speed. So 3,2500, it's this difference, it's 8.4 Hertz. Okay, so let's perform a simple calculation. So we have identified 8.4, 8.3 Hertz. That basically means that in the time zero day, we can suppose they are in phase. After three revolutions, they are out of phase. After six revolutions, they are again in phase. So every six revolutions, they are in phase. So since the lambda is the velocity times the number of revolutions, we can get that having the known speed that is 0.2 millimeter per round. This is the tangential speed. We times for the number of the revolution and we get 1.2 millimeters. OK, this is from the calculation from, from the vibration analysis. That's fine. And then we need to compare this value with the measurement. So we take a measurement of the distance between this circular line and we measure 1.2 millimeters. So this is the confirmation that unfortunately this comes from the beating. So everything that we have said, so the difference of the speed of the two spindle has created this chattering. And the distance is a, it's exactly lambda that is generated by the, the, the beating of the two spindles. OK, what are the recommendations? The recommendation is surely to decrease the balance, the, the residual unbalancing of the spindle. OK, that's fine. To increase the, steam, the stiffness of the second spindle. And I would add that it is important either to interrupt the transfer path between the two spindle, if this is possible, OK, in order to not to, yeah, to prevent to transfer the vibration from one spindle to another one. Great. This was the last case. Uh, just uh, one, two slide to summarize uh, SKF capabilities already mentioned, but me, Pete, uh, me and Pete Van Dalen, we are focusing on noise and vibration and uh, we can perform measurement and uh, analysis on site or remotely. Uh, let's say that sometimes if uh, a customer do not have any kind of tools, uh, they can easily send us the recording made by their mobiles and we can do our best. Sometimes we, we can support either with a poor quality from, from a mobile recording. Uh, capability about modeling and simulation for sure, as we've, as we've showed. And uh, our focus is anyhow the application, so the system. Uh, we perform either some training, Tuve is responsible of that, so we have a pretty wide 
training portfolio, not just related to the noise and vibration or condition monitoring. And still, we need to mention that we have a pretty wide and complete product portfolio about condition monitoring product, uh, and we have several service engineers and reliability engineers uh, spread out around the world. Uh, about condition monitoring product, we have uh, one sensor rather than eight, 16 channels uh, duck. We have portable instrument as well. Uh, I, you're welcome to visit our website in order to discover other products. And this is our footprint uh, worldwide. As I mentioned to you, there are many uh, technicians spread around the world and anyhow they can send the data through the cloud uh, that can be analyzed by us or by me, Pete, or the most expert technicians. Contacts, if you have any doubt, any question, any request, please take contact with your account manager, SKF account manager, SKF application engineers. Uh, if your contact is an SKF distributor, take contact with them, otherwise visit the, the, the the website uh, skf.com. Thanks to everybody. Bye.